uh, turn the presentation over to Stephen Barber. Thank you, Tim. Uh, this presentation is designed to give a general overview as to the procedures that a town will follow once it has adopted the SB2 form of balloting. Uh, and fundamentally, the SB2 form of balloting creates two sessions of the town meeting. So instead of having a town meeting where you vote on all warrant articles, you're now going to have two sessions, a deliberative session and a voting session. And the voting session will just be ballot uh, voting in the ballot box. Uh, and the deliberative session is for opportunity to discuss all warrant articles. So once you undertake and your town meeting has decided to go the SB2 route of uh, deliberating and voting on matters before the town meeting, you will then thenceforth always have two separate sessions of the town meeting. And the session for the ballot question will have the final budgets and questions printed in the annual report, and they'll have to be made available to the legislative body at least one week before the date of the second session. And roughly speaking, the first and second sessions are about 30 days apart. Uh, and as a result, uh, you have to have your town report finalized only after the first session because you don't know what the ballot's going to look like until the first session is over and any amendments have been made. The first thing you have to account for as you move forward through the new SB2 form of running the town meeting is that you have a new calendar. And you have a new calendar that has to achieve all of your hearings by your budget committee and other hearings that may be required before the Board of Selectmen and deadlines for certain activities. On this page, we've, I've outlined the significant uh, deadlines for posting and public hearings, and I just want to go through these briefly. Now, on each bullet, I've indicated in the first section of the bullet before the parenthesis, that's for the March town meeting. And then inside the parenthesis at the end of each bullet, I've given you deadlines for if you had a April or May town meeting. But I'm just going to refer to the March town meeting. So the final date for posting notice of budget committee budget hearings and for notice of hearings by the selectmen on bonds of $100,000 or more is January 13, 2015. And this is uh, tied into the calendar year 2015 for this presentation. Uh, a critical next deadline, similar to uh, the deadline for posting notice of the budget hearing, is that CBA negotiations have to be completed uh, and petition warrant articles have to be submitted also by January 13th. And that's an important deadline because if you've gone to SB2 and you have CBAs that you have to negotiate, that's a very important deadline. And it may uh, require the, the acceleration of your negotiation process for a CBA. Budget hearings have to be completed by January 20th. Bond hearings have to be completed by January 20th. And the budget committee has to deliver the final budget with recommendations by January 22nd. Um, now, there was an amendment that ties into the next bullet dealing with zoning amendments, which I think uh, is a, an amendment to the statutes uh, RSA 4013. All of and most of the content of this presentation is derived from RSA 4013, having to do with when planning boards have to complete their zoning hearings and tying it back into the regular town meeting process, which I would urge you to um, somewhat ignore, because regardless of what the time period that you're now allowed to use what regular town meeting, if you're an SB2 town, the planning board must complete its zoning hearings in time to post the text of those zoning amendments at the time of posting of the warrant. So whenever you're building your schedule for the planning board to hold hearings on zoning amendments and you're an SB2 town, keep in mind these posting deadlines, which again I'm emphasizing the March deadline, January 26, 2015. You're going to have two hearings which require 10-day notice and a 14-day gap between the two hearings. You've got to build in that timetable so you can post the zoning amendments uh, with the posting of the warrant. And again, that's the last bullet. Warrant and budgets have to be posted by January 26th. 
Now, a critical and important concept that ties into the uh, process of having an SB2 town is the default budget. Um, and the default budget is a very important financial statement of the expenses that a town had in the prior fiscal year, which will become your budget if the town meeting does not adopt the budget as proposed by uh, the selectmen and as approved by the budget committee. So the default budget is an amount, and as an SB2 town, not only will you be posting a proposed budget for adoption, you'll also be posting a separate document called the default budget both of which will be posted with the warrant. So the default budget is the amount of the same appropriations as contained in the operating budget from the previous year, reduced or increased by public obligations mandated by law. So the default budget will include debt service, because you have to pay for it. It will include contracts previously approved, CBA contracts. Um, it's going to be reduced by one-time expenditures. So if uh, in your prior fiscal year, you had a one-time expenditure for constructing an improvement to the town hall, that's not going to be included in the default budget. Um, and uh, it, the, the idea here is for one-time expenditures not likely to reoccur uh, are not intended to be included in the default budget. And Steve, I wanted to just give a little history about this whole concept of the default budget. And when SB2, the whole uh, idea of having an official ballot voting, was being um, debated by the legislature back in the mid-90s, I was actually at the Department of Revenue Administration and following this legislation very closely. And one of the concerns that I had was as they were proceeding through how to do this official ballot voting process, my concern was that they seemed to be um, ending at the point where the voters could go into the ballot booth and vote no on the operating budget and kind of call it a day. And my concern was that, well, if the voters vote no on the operating budget, their work really isn't done. In a traditional town meeting, if the voters voted down the budget, you basically have some procedures to stay until you figure out what voters are willing to vote yes for not just what they're voting no for. So um, that was raised uh, with the uh, legislators that were just, you know, putting this process together. And there were a variety of ways that they could deal with what happens if the voters vote no. Um, they could um, assume that the, a percentage of the budget being proposed was voted, or they could require that voters come back in a more traditional town meeting form to see what they're willing to say yes to. But what they decided on was having this concept of this default budget, where it's basically last year's operating budget um, that would then be deemed to be appropriated if, in fact, the operating budget was um, voted down. Um, I will say that the default budget has been one that um, has had quite a few amendments to the law since it was enacted in 1995. In fact, I think this statute um, been in place about 20 years, and I think 13 out of those 20 years we've had legislation tweaking RSA 4013, and a lot of it has been dealing with this idea of the default budget, probably because the assumption early on was that this default budget was going to be so much less than what the operating budget that was being requested was, and that wasn't necessarily always the case. Um, so there have been quite a bit of um, amendments to this statute since then. But that's just a little bit of the history of where this concept of the default budget came from. And I would just add on that subject, Barbara, that having represented a number of towns through the town meeting process under SB2, it is not uncommon, and I've seen it a number of times, that the default budget is actually higher than the budget as proposed by the selectmen of the Budget Committee. And that happens uh, not infrequently. Um, so it's something that uh, merits careful attention to how you draft your default budget. So uh, talking about the default budget in operation, you know, the idea is to freeze the budget at the previous level uh, of expenditures uh, and to uh, accept for matters or items that are legally obligated to be paid, so, uh, which were one-time expenses. Now, along those lines, employee raises generally should not be included unless they're part of a legally binding contract. Um, and as continuing on with the default budget, one of the concepts you can use is that uh, if you're dealing with a per unit cost of a certain commodity, such as the cost of bituminous concrete, 
The default budget includes the amount of money from the previous year, not the amount that would be required for the same number of the same number of tons of bituminous conflict in the coming year. Um, and another important concept to keep in mind when the default budget is being drafted, you can't add new budget line items uh, because they were not part of the appropriations contained in the previous year's budget. Steve, one thing I think that is important to note here is that um, there, there isn't anyone officially policing the default budget. For example, with the um, Department of Revenue Administration, as most of our participants know, they're looking very closely at uh, a lot of the forms and a lot of the action by your town meetings in terms of whether the appropriations are valid. When it comes to the, the default budget, DRA, the Department of Revenue, is not the ones that are going to allow or disallow um, whatever the numbers are that are included in that default budget. So it's really, um, I think it's really the, the voters in your own town that would be the ones that would be challenging potentially anything that they saw that was questionable in the default budget. But there really isn't anyone at the state level doing that. And I guess that would be sort of a policing action by the town meeting. Uh, we'll get to this later on, but the default budget by default, <laughs> uh, pardon the redundancy, is in fact created by the selectmen, although there is an option under 40, code 4013 where the town meeting can say that we want the budget committee to create the default budget. Okay, and we have one of our first of two poll questions here. So as of 2012, how many towns in New Hampshire have adopted the SB2 form of voting? So we'll give you a few minutes to decide on your answer. Um, and just for the record, there are 234 cities and towns in the state. So is your answer A, 100, B, 80, C, 60, or D, 40 for the number of municipalities we have in 2012 that are operating under the SB2 form of government? Okay, if there's anyone who hasn't yet submitted your answer, please do so now and we'll look and see what our poll is showing. And do we have a response? Nope. All right, and the answer is, Steve? C, 60. 60 towns that have adopted as of 2012 the SB2 form of voting. So for any town that is thinking of uh, going to the SB2 form of voting, um, there are quite a few other municipalities you can consult with to uh, sort of learn the ins and outs. That's right. So I've already covered this to some degree. Uh, who compares the default budget? Um, it rests first and foremost with the governing body, uh, which is the selectmen. Uh, and by the way, the default budget is something that at the deliberative session you can't alter. So the default budget will be set uh, by the by the selectmen, uh, and then when it goes to the deliberative session, where normally you can amend or revise warrant articles, you can't amend, revise, or in any way uh, make different the content of the default budget. Um, and as I previously indicated, uh, RSA Chapter 40 does permit a process where the budget committee can be delegated the authority to create the default budget. Um, as I previously indicated, the default budget must be posted with the warrant. So again, when the selectmen post the warrant, they're going to post a warrant containing the articles that would be voted on, including the proposed uh, budget for the town, but also the warrant will have posted with us the default budget so people can see all the line items that represent the expenditures from the prior year, all the one-time expenditures which are excluded by definition, you can compare that to the proposed budget, and all the items that uh, would be included because they're mandated by law or by other contracts or agreements. Um, one of the other things that we want to cover is not just the financial aspects of having uh, two uh, meetings to uh, present the town warrant and have it voted on. Again, this is the two meeting process. You have a deliberative session, you have a voting session. Um, you have to have a checklist updated for each session of the town meeting. 
So with the SB2 form of town meeting, you now have two sessions. And the checklist supervisors will have to be in session not only, uh, I believe it's a Saturday 6 to 13 days prior to the first session, um, but also 6 to 13 days prior to the voting session. Now let's talk about the deliberative session and what that looks like in terms of the difference between the regular town meeting. Having participated in many deliberative sessions, I can tell you in general a deliberative session is very much like a regular town meeting, but for the fact that there's no final action taken on any warrant articles. The only action that is taken is the possibility that the voters might wish to amend warrant articles or they may wish to uh, zero out uh, line items in the budget. Um, those would be the, uh, or amend the bottom line of the budget. Those are the things that town meeting could do at the deliberative session, but there's no final voting at the deliberative session. There's just debate, discussion, possible amendment, and then all warrant articles as presented on the warrant are required to go to the ballot session. And Steve, one comment that I wanted to make here that I think is a little bit challenging uh, for those that are um, heading into the SB2 process, particularly for the first time, is the idea of having sort of a, warrant articles that are contingent upon each other. For example, um, maybe what's being put forth to the voters is to raise an appropriate a certain amount of money to do to repair a building or to raise an appropriate a certain amount of money to replace the building. And in a traditional town meeting, it's very easy to put forth both articles, allow the voters to discuss and debate, and, and then take a vote on, on which one they really want. I mean, voting one down or the other one passing or whatever. That becomes a little bit more tricky when you're dealing with an SB2 situation, if you're having articles that are tied in together um, with the intent that if one fails, this one is going to, if this one passes, then it's presumed that that one fails or whatever, because you don't know what's happening because you're not taking the vote. So there needs to be some um, careful crafting of those articles that may be contingent on each other or articles that, for example, uh, something may already be in the operating budget and there's a petitioned article for the same thing. It, it, it needs to be carefully, uh, carefully worded so that the voters aren't accidentally voting appropriations twice, for example, or understanding that, um, you know, that they had intended to pass one, you know, they don't lose both of them. So some of that contingent language can be a little tricky. Um, so the deliberative session for the March town meeting is held between January 31st and February 2nd of 2015. And you can see the dates that I've indicated for the uh, April and May town meetings. And as I've already indicated, the first session is the introduction of articles, discussion, possible amendment, and then the articles go to the warrant. And many moderators simply stand up and say, we'll take article number one. Uh, there'll be a proposal to uh, put it forth to the uh, ballot. Uh, the moderator will ask to, if, if there's any discussion or presentation from the selectmen or the budget committee, uh, and then typically the moderator will say, does anyone wish to further discuss? Uh, do I hear any amendments? And if there's no further discussion or amendments, typically a moderator will say, okay, Article 12, if that's the one that's being discussed, will go to the ballot as presented. Um, Warrant articles prescribed by law cannot be amended. So zoning amendments, and there are certain statutes where you are adopting certain procedures. Uh, if it's required by law, you can't amend that warrant article. One of the other key elements to keep in mind in the amendment process is you can't amend an article to eliminate the subject matter. And in fact, um, before this statute was amended, I dealt with a number of situations where uh, in a town I represented, uh, the town wanted to adopt an ordinance to regulate dance halls and places of assembly. And there were a number of people at the town meeting who didn't like the idea. So what they said was, well, I want to amend the article to see if the town will not adopt a certain ordinance. And I told the moderator, that's out of order. You can amend the article to change its substance, but not to eliminate it, uh, the subject matter completely. And that's an important limitation on the actions that can be taken at the deliberative session. Um, you cannot eviscerate an article by saying, we shall not do something, or to 
uh, ask the moderator to strike out the text in a proposed warrant article. And again, very important concept here, all warrant articles have to be placed on the official ballot, including those articles amended by the first session. So even if the voters amend the dollar amount down to zero, the article needs to show up. It has to go on the warrant. It has right. to go on the warrant. So, so if there was an article to see if the town raised an appropriate $100,000 to put into the public works equipment um, uh, reserve fund. capital reserve fund, if the voters said we're going to zero that out, that article still goes to the warrant. Uh, ballot recommendations are very important in an SB2 town. I've seen it time and time again that these recommendations sometimes are the only piece of information that the voters are going to be able to rely upon because many of them may not have gone to the deliberative session or may not read the materials distributed by the Board of Selectmen. So it's important that these budget recommendations be made as they're required to, um, as indicated in, on this slide, the Budget Committee and the Selectmen have to give their recommendations on all articles containing appropriations. An important element in the process of making recommendations as permitted by um, the budget law is that those recommendations can be modified by the Governing Committee and the Budget Committee if there's a change in the amount of warrant articles as being presented. And, that, and the same thing is true with regards to the operating budget. If there's a change in an amount, uh, the gross amount proposed for the budget article, uh, the Budget Committee and or the Governing Body can modify their recommendations. Many towns, those that I have represented in the SB2 towns, in fact what they will do, they will post notice that the Budget Committee and the Selectmen will hold a public meeting at the conclusion of the deliberative session, and then the Budget Committee and the, the Selectmen meet at that time and make a decision as to whether or not they want to keep their existing recommendations or modify them. And I think that's a good practice. Um, one thing that is important to keep in mind is that um, the original recommendation by the Budget Committee um, is what governs the 10% limitation on expenditures. So even though the Budget Committee can modify its uh, uh, its recommendation, the first recommendation it makes is the one that's used by DRA to determine the 10% limitation on appropriations above the amount recommended by the Budget Committee. Um, the voting session, of, of course, is where the final decision is made by the voters as to whether to adopt the proposed uh, town meeting warrant and the budget. Um, so in the March town meeting, uh, the second Tuesday in uh, March, and, or the second Tuesday in April, or the second Tuesday in May, uh, is the traditional date for town meeting. And that's a ballot session that's all done in the voting booth, um, and it's the, the warrant is presented uh, just as if it was a, uh, an election, um, but this time it's, I guess, similar to what you might have seen in the past when you were voting just on the zoning amendments you'll have this ballot content that has to be voted on, uh, yes or no. Um, the thing to keep in mind uh, is that the way in which the ballot is presented or information that you might want to provide to support warrant articles uh, is important. So many town meetings uh, who are under the SB2 form of government will oftentimes take steps after the deliberative session to pre present voters guides to supplement the information that won't be there before them on the ballot by itself. You know, prepare a voter's guide that describes the articles in more detail, post those voter's guides on the town's website, distribute them, uh, do webinars such as this or other presentations, because again, you have to spend some to the selectmen, the budget committee, or other governing bodies have to spend some time to get the word out about what the ballot uh, it's all about what's on the warrant, uh, what's important, what what impact it will have on the town, because you don't have that chance to do that anymore at just the town meeting. And again, if you don't have a lot of people attending the deliberative session, they won't have that information to make a, an informed judgment on. So we have our second poll question here, and our question is, based on a sample of 27 SB2 towns, what is the average number of voters on the 2010 checklist of voters who attended their town's deliberative session? 
in our choice of answers are 4.3%, 5.5%, 1.5%, or 2.4%. And our polls are open now for you to place your answer. And we'll just give you a minute for doing that. And Steve, our answer is 2.4%. Uh, 2.4% is the correct answer. So, uh, not a lot of people attend in deliberative sessions? <laughs> not as not, not <laughs> many. Um, uh, that was based on a study that uh, was commissioned by the New Hampshire Municipal Association in 2012. Um, going on further about the content of your ballot measure, um, there, is, there are very specific ways in which the budget article is presented and the uh, ballot law tells you exactly how the budget article is worded and you do have to word it exactly as presented here on uh, this particular slide um, because the article not only sets forth what is being proposed um, by the budget for adoption by the town but also it gives you the number that represents what would be the default budget. And it also contains, as you can see in the last sentence, and we'll pick this up later, um, that um, if the, the, the article is not adopted, um, the selectmen are given authority by this Warren article to call one special town meeting to consider the adoption uh, of uh, an operating budget. But that would be a revised operating budget. Uh, so presumably the idea here is that if this article is defeated um, and you selectmen are not prepared to quite accept the default budget, they'd have to come, on with, come in with a revised operating budget for consideration at a special town meeting. And that special town meeting would have both? A deliberative, deliberative session, session and a regular session. A regular it, would be, session. A, it would be the whole process all over again. Right. Um, one comment that I wanted to make on, on this section, I think what's important to note is the language uh, up on that second line there, uh, when it's talking about the operating budget for an SB2 municipality, it does not include appropriations by special warrant articles and other appropriations voted separately. So from a strategic planning standpoint, you have to think about what will your default budget look like next year. Because your default budget next year is going to be based on the operating budget this year. And that operating budget, under this definition, under in SB2, that operating budget does not include those appropriations that are voted by special warrant articles or any appropriations that were voted separately. So when you're deciding what to do this year in terms of uh, pulling uh, items out of your operating budget in order to ha allow the voters to vote on them separately, if, in fact, those appropriations are approved, they will not be considered part of the operating budget for purposes of calculating your default budget next year. So uh, when, you're, when you're putting this together this year, you do have to kind of think about the impact it might have next year on the default budget. Um, one thing I would mention as an aside, uh, there was an, a recent amendment to uh, RSA 4013, which allows uh, the town to have a separate operating budget and default budget for enterprise funds. Um, so um, some towns have begun to think that the enterprise fund, which typically deals with either a sewer department or a water department, um, those tend to uh, skew um, in a fashion the numbers on the operating budget when they're included in a way that are, maybe are sometimes hard for the voters to understand. And as a result, there has been and there is an option that towns have to separately break out their enterprise funds in separate operating budget uh, and uh, default budget. And that's just an option which is available to towns who have sewer and water departments. And I, I think, Steve, the reason for that was because oftentimes the, the water and sewer fees that are going to be taken in are, you know, address the whole appropriation. So the appropriation for the water department matches the revenue that's going to come in. If there's an increase in the appropriation that's needed, there's going to be an increase in the fees. And the um, SB2 form of voting didn't necessarily take care of uh, those kinds of increases and the offsetting revenue. So I think that's why the legislature was willing to allow those to be dealt with separately and have their own default budgets. 
There's also uh, in the next slide a description which is similar to the uh, description you would find in the zoning and planning statutes on how an SB2 town goes about adopting an ordinance. And I think the point here was to make it easier for towns to post their warrant and some towns were finding it that they really felt it was essential that they print the entire content of a proposed ordinance or amendment in the town warrant and of course that would make a very long ballot and so the, uh, the statute has been uh, modified to make clear that you can use a topical description methodology for describing an ordinance and the language which is on the, the next page is very similar to the language of how you would adopt the form of an ordinance uh, with regards to zoning and planning. They basically took the zoning and planning statute which is I believe 675 colon, 675 colon 4 and, and adopted the same language so that it's clear you don't have to print the entire content of a proposed ordinance uh, on the ballot. You can be done by reference to a topical description so long as a full copy of the proposed ordinance can be found uh, at appropriate places in town such as the town hall, town library, etc. Now the voting at the next session as indicated on the next slide conforms to all of the standard procedures for nonpartisan balloting including the requirements pertaining to absentee voting, polling place, and polling hours. So uh, the election that will take place at the voting booth on the date of the vote on the town warrant is going to follow the, all the same procedures that you would have for a normal ballot vote uh, for candidates for election. Uh, and again, as I've said previously, you also have to have another checklist, uh, supervisors of a checklist meeting, uh, I believe again it's the 6 to 13 days, uh, Saturdays, the, six, the Saturday 6 to 13 days prior to the date set for the second session. Um, approval of all warrant articles is by simple majority, except where necessary a two-thirds or an SB2 town, uh, the uh, adoption of a, an article to raise and appropriate money by bonded indebtedness over $100,000 or just any bonded indebtedness is by three-fifths um, or, or unless required by law, contract, or the written agreement. So it's basically simple majority or by two-thirds or three-fifths depending upon whether a particular law or statute applies. Votes taken at the second session cannot be reconsidered. So again, this is unless unlike regular town meeting, if you were a town meeting, uh, and you felt that you know you wanted to reconsider the vote on the warrant uh, concerning the budget. You could you know at 11 o'clock at night make a motion to reconsider unless somebody had restricted reconsideration. Um, that is clearly not possible at the ballot session of this type. Uh, votes taken at the second session are subject to recount, um, and so you can ask for a recount. Uh, and I've seen that done on a number of occasions where. Uh, votes were particularly close, especially on the on the, the budget article. Um, as I previously indicated, as indicated on this slide, if the budget article is not approved, the default budget is deemed automatically approved, or the selectman can hold one special meeting, um, which will involve both a deliberative and voting session. Um, so, uh, and I've gone through this process before, and if you're a March town meeting, um, you have to ramp up pretty quickly to get the necessary hearings in in, in a timetable and I, my recollection is it roughly takes about 95 to 100 days to fit in all the times you need to hearings and whatnot in order to hold a, a regular a SB2 town meeting. So um, the problem is if you're in a March town meeting and your default but your budget is not approved um, if you don't act very quickly, you're going to end up having a special town meeting sometime in June or July and likely could be criticized for doing it at a time when there are a few people around. So it's something that you have to keep in mind. It's just the reality of the timetables that are, you're, you're kind of compressing those timetables in a way that uh, you have to be very careful. You meet them all properly, uh, but then you also have to be concerned about if you hold such a special town meeting to adopt a revised operating budget, you have to also do the process of figuring out what the revised budget is, and uh, that requires a, a great deal of uh, patience and skill, and again, you're going to have to usually act fairly promptly. And I, and I would think there would be a concern if you're a, a calendar year municipality, 
you're already adopting a budget in March, you're already you know, two and a half months into your year before you really know what your budget is. Uh, and if you had to go this route of you know, having, having the budget turned down and then trying to hold that special meeting again and you're looking to June, you're practically six months into your year before you even know what your budget for the year is. That would be pretty challenging from a financial standpoint, I think. Right, and I think that's a good point, Barbara, is that it, it you know, I've seen the decision made by the selectmen, but I think that many times the selectmen realize if we go that route, uh, it's going to be a challenge for the departments to operate. It's going to be a challenge for the town to move forward. Um, but again, it's an option that it, it is an automatic option that the town uh, conveys to the selectmen, given the language in the in the SP2 statute and in the budget article that would be ad adopted or, for that matter, rejected. I, I did, and I did want to mention we're getting close to the end of the presentation. So if anyone has any questions, um, feel free to type them in now, and we'll try to work them in through the end of the session. And, and finally, I guess what I want to reaffirm is that the budget article, if it's not approved, nonetheless, estimated revenues are deemed to have been approved. Um, looking forward to the, the time that you've gone through an SB2 process and maybe you've decided that you want to change the date for your SB2 town meeting from March to April or May, um, the, the Related statute to RSA 4013, 4014, permits the town to adopt an April or May town meeting date. And it requires a series of steps uh, for the selectmen to propose it or to have it proposed by petition. It requires a public hearing before um, it will be voted on. Uh, it, the statute, as indicated here, gives you the exact language of how you would present it to the voters. It has to be approved by simple majority. And the change that would be adopted would only apply to the next town meeting. And I think where we see most of the April or May town meetings are those municipalities that have a June 30th year end, so that they're actually um, voting the appropriations in April or May for their fiscal year that's going to begin on July 1st. I, I don't think we see many or really any that have a calendar year fiscal year where they're going to the April or May. Uh, meeting. I think there's. Uh, it's also my experience that um, this type of a change in a town that has an SP2 form of government, uh, th this this particular section of the statute allows also some uh, congruity in, in, to bring together the meeting dates for both the town and the school district. And many times, this will allow both of those agencies to more closely coordinate when they're going to hold their meetings, whether they hold them on the same day or, or within the same time period, April, May, or March. Uh, I think this, this particular statute gives more flexibility for that purpose. So that concludes the slides that we have here today. And uh, we, don't we don't have any questions. So well, thank you very much for attending our webinar today. Well, well not so quick, Steve. Oh. I want to first thank you and Barbara for sharing your expertise and for this very informative uh, webinar session for our members. And we do want to thank our members for participating in this webinar today. As you may know, we are recording this webinar and we'll be sharing a YouTube link with you in a day or two. Once you receive it, we encourage you to distribute this uh, link to your colleagues and other officials in your city or town. In addition, you should receive from us a link to a short survey and evaluation form. We ask that you take a couple moments to fill that out and share your feedback with us. Again, a recording of this webinar will be sent to you probably early next week. and. Uh, Thank you again for your participation today. Please enjoy the rest of your afternoon.